Happy Wednesday, Locked On fam. Happy spring training report. Oh, wait. Never mind. Well, how about we look at the best Cubs designated hitters of all time? Because, well, you know, Locked On Cubs coming at you. You are Locked On Cubs, your daily Chicago Cubs podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. Welcome on in. This is indeed Locked on Cubs. I'm your host, Andrew Bellison. Awesome to be with you today. It's my job to tell you that Locked on Cubs is part of the Locked on Podcast Network and proud to be. Also, my job to thank you sincerely from the deep, deep bottom of my heart for making Locked on Cubs your first listen each and every morning. I say it every day. It's not in the script. It is not jargon. You guys mean the world to me. This is your show. I am privileged to be here to be able to host, and it is awesome to be along for the ride. So thank you for coming uh, and and being with us each and every morning and making us your first listen. Engage with us on Twitter. Love to interact with you guys on social media. At Lockdown Cubs, at Chicago Cubs PA. Let me know what you like. Let me know your thoughts. Let me know what you don't like. It's all about having fun. Let's respect each other's opinion and enjoy one another talking baseball on the Twitter machine. Locked on Cubs, Wednesday edition, awesome stuff on tap. We're going to continue our Zips projections for the 2022 Cubs 26-man roster and individual stats. Again, can't put a ton of stock in them, maybe, but we're locked out. We don't have much else to talk about. Speaking of that, we're going to give you a locked out update. You hear what they want to do? The owners, mind you, to the minor leagues. Again, not cool. Stick around for that. But first, like it or not, the designated hitter is going to be introduced full-time into the National League as part of the new CBA. Purists like me says, eh, I'm indifferent. I don't love it, but I don't hate it. I think it could benefit a team like the Cubs greatly, putting another very capable bat in the lineup and rounding out that starting nine. Um But again, I still miss the bullpens being in the field of play at Wrigley Field. So I'm a bit of an old school curmudgeon purist in that regard. I will say this. From a competitive standpoint, we're all pretty educated Cubs fans, I would like to say. And I try to judge this without having my heart get in the way too much. Um, It makes sense for the Cubs to be able to utilize a designated hitter. So for that reason, I root for this part of the CBA that will be changed when the new agreement is finally hashed out. It provides them with a pretty large advantage. Let me explain. First off, let's go down memory lane and take a look at a little bit of history. 50 plus players have started a designated hitter for the Cubs in the entire existence of their organization. This started back in 1997 when interleague play was still in its infancy in Major League Baseball. First ever regular season Cubs-White Sox game at New Comiskey Park on the south side. Cubs designated hitter June 16, 1997 was Dave Clark. He hit fifth in the Cubs lineup that day. Remember the veteran lefty? Went one for four off Jamie Navarro. With a single in the first, he also DH'd the next game, collecting a pair of hits, as a matter of fact. Clark started a designated hitter in four of the first six games the Cubs ever played with the extra hitter and hit the Cubs' first designated hitter home run ever on August 31st, 1997. That's back when they would kind of do like a quickie two two or maybe just you know the three games against the Sox as, as it before interleague uh, play evolved into what it is today with a, a good chunk of of each team's schedule um heck some teams start the year now with interleague play um the Cubs used six different starters at designated hitter in their first nine regular season games in AL Parks in 1997 one Hall of Famer Ryan Sandberg, who started there in the third game of the 97 Crosstown Series. Rhino collected a single off Wilson Alvarez. Remember Wilson Alvarez for the Sox? Uh, That, as a matter of fact, was the only hit at designated hitter of Sandberg's major league career. Lance Johnson, one dog, he DH'd that year 
for Jim Riggleman as well. Henry Rodriguez then turning the page in 1998, the wild card year was the first Cub to start three consecutive games at DH. This was in June of 98. He was also the first Cubs designated hitter to homer in consecutive games at Tiger Stadium. Oh, Henry, you got the candy bars ready? Let's toss them out there. Glenn Allen Hill was the go-to guy the next two years in 99 and 2000. Started 13 of the 15 games at designated hitters. Is he still available? Because I think he could still poke one into the basket at Wrigley. That's just my opinion. In the 01 Crosstown Series, Cubs used a fun designated hitter combo of Matt Stairs, power hitting left-hander, and current Cubs broadcaster on the SCORE radio network. Ron Coomer was DH in that series as well. Roosevelt Brown, remember the lefty Rosie Brown in July? Brown actually recorded what remains as the only five-hit game by a Cubs designated hitter. That came back in July 2001 at Comerica Park in Detroit. Freddie McGriff, Moise Salou, Todd Huntley in 2002, 2003. Moise Salou was the Cubs designated hitter for all nine games, which it was used. The only other time the Cubs went an entire year using just one DH. 2012, who was it? Alfonso Soriano. In 2004, Sammy Sosa made his first starts at designated hitter since 1989 when he played for the Texas Rangers. He entered a game as a pinch hitter for a DH twice with the White Sox in 91, but they weren't starts. In his second start on June 27th at U.S. Cellular Field, Sosa posted the first ever multi-homer game by a Cubs designated hitter. It was Sammy's last game as Cubs DH. 2005, this is kind of fun. Remember Jason Dubois? He homered twice in three starts at DH. Michael Barrett DH'd at U.S. Cellular Field on May 19, 2006. Moved behind the plate the following day and jacked A.J. Pierzynski in the face. Remember that? Lou Pinella came in 07. He gave Derek Lee and Aramis Ramirez a lot of the reps in 2008. Here's some names for you from 09. Jake Fox, Micah Hoffpower, guys who mashed in the minors but never really figured it out at the big league level. Uh, Soriano got a few more opportunities as well. As a matter of fact, by the time he left the Cubs, his 14 starts at designated hitter past Glenn Allen Hill for most in team history. Soriano was brilliant as a designated hitter with the Cubs. 345, six homers, 14 ribbies. Then he had some lean years, uh, kind of when I got hired by the Cubs. Mike Olt, Nate Scherholz, Ryan Sweeney, Luis Valbuena. They garnered most of the designated hitter at bats. So really fun trip down memory lane, looking at some of the guys who acted as designated hitter for the Cubs um, in a position that really at the time was a novelty because it was not going to be instituted in the National League and it was not discussed as being such in any way. So kind of fun to see who took their turn and who did it well. Um, it's a whole different animal being a designated hitter. You have no distraction. You get your four plate appearances and in between at bats, you sit in the dugout and think, I mean, of course you're engaged in the game. You're staying loose. You're hitting a little bit right in the tunnel, but still there is no distraction. So it's definitely a different approach. Some of these guys who are really good hitters aren't necessarily the best in the designated hitter role because it doesn't always translate the same, right? Be curious to talk to some professional designated hitters, Edgar Martinez like guys, about that as well. So we had some great names on the list, right? And I'd be curious to see who takes the bulk of these reps moving forward. We're going to dive into that later in the week, potential DH candidates for the Cubs here in 2022. But before we do, Kyle Schwarber, is he the best to ever do it for the Cubs? As a designated hitter, 267 in 45 games, 10 home runs, 22 knocked in, 383 on base percentage. Maybe. We all know what Kyle did in the World Series. We know what he did in the DH role during those playoff runs. A lot of fun to think about maybe bringing him back to be the Cubs 2022 DH. Thought this was fun. Overall statistics for hitters in the DH spot for the Cubs compared to pitchers. And I know the hitters are going to outperform the pitchers offensively any day. But get this. All-time Cubs designated hitter totals. All-time. Now, this is heading into the 2022 or to, heading into the 2020 season. I apologize. So we're a little dated here. Our research team needs to pick it up. But thank you for that walk down memory lane. 
Heading into the 2020 season, all-time Cubs DH totals, 811 plate appearances, 266 average, 322 on base, 468 slugging, 37 homers, 124 knocked in. That's in 811 plate appearances. On the flip side, Cubs pitchers from 1997, when the DH started in interleague play in the National League, through heading into the 2020 season. So 97 through entering the 2020 season, 8,292 plate appearances for Cubs pitchers, buck 50 average, buck 78 on base, 66 home runs in 8,300 plate appearances. So half the home runs or double the home runs in 10 times the amount of plate appearances. I know it's stupid, but it's fun to look at. Awesome look down memory lane. Now that it's here to stay, again, tomorrow we're going to dive into some of the best DH options for the Cubs in 2022. Fun list. Like to look at that kind of stuff. Get into our continued Zips projections here coming up in a moment. We're going to take a look at the Cubs starting rotation today. And I've been preaching it all offseason. The rotation is a lot better than you think it is. Again, this could still all be in flux. Offseason to continue after the lockout? Well, we hope so because we don't think the Cubs are done spending. Before we get there, it's the time of year that I know a lot of people have given up on their New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I hope you're sticking to it, and I hope Built Bar is helping you. Built Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate, 100% real chocolate. If you have incorporated them into your diet, you have helped yourself out. They taste great and they're good for you, loaded with protein. 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four grams of net carbs, and 17 grams of protein in most bars. If you don't count macros as part of your diet, calorie kind of thing, that's awesome numbers. Ton of protein, not a lot of sugar. Compared to a candy bar, normally like 240 calories, 30 grams of sugar. It's all garbage, garbage, garbage. Get rid of that. Built Bar's the way to go. Listen to some of these flavors. Mint brownie, coconut almond, New for this month, white chocolate cookies and cream. Are you kidding me? Delicious. Do me a favor. Go to Built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15. You're going to get 15% off your order at Built.com using promo code LOCKED15. Try the Built Bar. You're going to like it. I promise. Zips projections coming up next. Locked on Cubs. Locked On Cubs family, welcome back in. This is Locked On Cubs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Want to thank you again for taking the time each and every a.m. to make us your first listen of the day. It means the world to me. Spending the mornings with you is literally the highlight of my day. Please check us out on YouTube, Locked On Cubs YouTube channel. Check us out on Twitter at Locked On Cubs at Chicago Cubs PA. I'm Andrew Bellis, and I'm your host. I was the Wrigley Field public address announcer for 10 years and now am privileged and honored to be a part of the Locked On podcast family. So we've been rolling through the Zips projections for the Cubs uh, for 2022. And again, this is all kind of where it stands now. The roster is going to change again. I think there's going to be a little bit of a free agency splurge as we head into the season after this lockout is lifted. But we're out of the starting pitchers. And what Zips has done is they've gone and projected each club's 26-man roster heading into the season as it stands now, as well as the individual statistics for those players. Now, meaningless? I don't know, kind of. But it's fun to look at to see how they stack up or how Zips thinks they stack up. So we've been giving our analysis on those projections here last week and this week. Starting rotation, as you might expect. Marcus Stroman, Kyle Hendricks, in no particular order there. Wade Miley, the waiver claim from the Reds in November, flown under the radar. I love this move. We'll get to it in a moment. And then the, the rounding out the back half. Edward Alzali and Alec Mills, probably safe bets to pencil in. Stroman was the splash. I mean, let's start at the top. Right before the lockout was was put in place. I mean, that caught me off guard. I was pumped as you know what. 30-year-old right-hander. Um, Pitched very well for a, for a Mets team last year that, you know, didn't accomplish what they hoped to as a club. Uh, 302 ERA, led the league with 33 starts, um, almost eight strikeouts per nine innings. He's going to get vaulted to the front end of this rotation with Kyle Hendricks, um, which you have to love that one-two punch. Stroman projected at 170 innings in 2022, 360 ERA and 150 strikeouts. So you, you got to like those numbers if you get them from the top guy. 
uh, in your rotation. Speaking of Hendricks, um, he had a really rough 2021. And I mean, we know the professor by now. We love him. Uh, career worst 477 ERA for the season. But the Cubs rotation as a group struggled mightily last year as well. Um, they had the fourth worst ERA in all of baseball at over, well over five, over five and a quarter, as a matter of fact. So Kyle Hendricks, the professor, now a Wiley vet, 32 years old. Um, part of the, the problem for his his struggles last year was his career low strikeout percentage, uh, which was under 17% for the first time in his career. And that awesome change, the dips and dives, um, didn't have the success that it did in years past as batters hit 270 against that changeup. And that was always a, a great throw in with that sinker that he threw. Same movement, but obviously the variable change in speed. So didn't have the success that he had with that. Zips has a bounce back year projected for Hendricks. And I honestly think just as a fan and a hopeful fan that they're going to probably be better than the Zips numbers even say. Having Stroman to rely on at the top of the order, is that stupid to say? I think Hendricks is going to be even better than they think. They've got him at 160 innings, 420 earned run average, 120 strikeouts, and only 33 walks. Now, if you're going to give me a 4-to-1 strikeout-to-walk ratio for Kyle Hendricks, he's going to have a good year. So I'll take that. I think the numbers might be even better than that. But we'll we'll have to stay tuned to find out. Wade Biley, whom I touched on a little bit before, waiver claim from the Reds. I love this. This guy is a lefty, crafty vet, uh, literally landed in the lap of the Cubs this offseason. And Jeff Carr, my colleague who hosts Lockdown Reds, still bitter about this. So we'll, we'll throw him a little dig. Sorry, Jeff. Um, after two seasons in Cincy, the Reds put Miley on waivers and the Cubs need a pitching help decision was very easy for them to make. Good numbers last year, 337 ERA, made 28 starts, struck out seven guys per nine, walked only 2.8 per nine. If he gets to those numbers or similar numbers in 2022, you can't ask much more from your number three. And I just love Stroman, Hendricks, and Miley. One, two, three. I think that's phenomenal. Zips has Miley at 143 innings, sub four ERA at 397, 107 strikeouts, 47 walks. Listen, very familiar with the National League Central, been with the Reds for two years, has pitched at Wrigley, knows the drill. I love this. I love it. I think it's a great, great, great under the radar move that they made way back in November. Now, the back end of the rotation, this is where things, you know, <clears throat> might have some question marks. There was some talk about bringing Danny Duffy in from the Royals. Well, he's on the shelf due to some arm surgery until middle of summer, probably. And then we'll be a bullpen guy, maybe moving back towards the rotation the following year, given his advanced age. I liked the idea of maybe a sign on the cheap there. I don't think they're done with arms, especially in the bullpen. And we'll get to that in a later show. Um, but however the end of the rotation shakes out is going to kind of shape the bullpen and vice versa. So as it stands right now, Albert Alzali would be penciled in at number four, according to Zips. And I like this a lot. Um, shaky full season workload last year, 26 years old, injured a couple times, once considered one of the better Cubs arms in terms of prospect, um, but he's going to have to work back towards that goal this year, I think, to regain some trust. But I like giving him another opportunity as a full-timer at the back end of the rotation. 458 ERA, gave up a lot of homers last year, 25 home runs, but also struck out over nine guys per nine. So he's got that power. arm. We've seen him pitch. I think he deserves the chance um, to lose a spot in the rotation in 2022, barring some big free agent signing from here, you know, from the now until the, the season starts. Tough to predict, but they've got Alzelay at 115 innings, four and a half ERA, 124 strikeouts. Again, you give him 25 starts and he's able to keep the ball in the ballpark and throw strikes. I think, you know, with his stuff, the potential is still there, even at 26 years old. So I, I love that. And then Alec Mills probably gets a good look as a number five guy. Um, had a rough 2021 as well. Again, the rotation as a whole did. We've been saying that. Um, he had a 507 ERA in 32 games, made 20 starts, a lot of home runs, 16 pitched out of the pen as well. They've got Mills at 125 innings, 511 ERA. You know, uh, again, you get him in a rhythm at the back of the rotation. He he stays healthy, gets a lot more help from the other four guys in that starting five than last year. And I think 
he might turn some heads. I mean, we know about Alec Mills by now, but the guy's a very serviceable right-hander, and I think that we will be pleasantly surprised with him at the back end of the rotation. Again, all of this kind of in flux. CBA is, you know, a new CBA is is reached. Um, we'll give an update uh, on that shortly. Free agency starts again, spring training. Things are going to change. So how the bullpen rotation shakes out, you know, from here on, on out, um, you know, might be a little bit different than these Zips projections. But I, I think the Zips projections on the starting rotation were, in my opinion, a little bit um, – conservative, and I think we're going to be pleasantly surprised. I love the Cubs rotation. I really do. I think it's going to be a lot better than people give them credit for, and uh, I'm excited to to see them go to work. CBA lockout update, not the best news. You hear what they want to do with the minor leagues? Bad stuff coming up in a moment. Before we get there, uh, we know football season's over, but basketball is in full steam for both pro and college hoops. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, betonline.net is the number one spot for all of your sports betting needs. BetOnline remains the best spot for all of your sports scores, podcasts, and news all season long, every season long. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, UFC odds, right to the Olympic coverage, and information. Head to the website today or use your mobile device and learn more about the trends and actions Bet online where the game starts. Locked on Cubs continues after this. Welcome back in Locked on Cubs. I'm your host, Andrew Bellison, former public address announcer at Wrigley Field, current Locked on Cubs host. Happy to be along for the ride. So thank you. Been fun looking at the Cubs pitching staff. Um, we have to throw in a lockout update. Uh, it's not what I want to do because the news hasn't been good. Can you believe, man, it's been since December 3rd or whatever it is that we've been doing this? Um, it just doesn't seem right. The, did you hear the latest? This this is just hot off the press. The league requests the ability to now eliminate hundreds of minor league roster spots um, per report. Jeff Passan put this out Um as it stands right now, major league organizations are currently allowed to employ up to 180 minor league players at any given time. So the league's proposal would have kept that number in place for the 2022 season. And that's across, your, that's across all levels in the minor leagues for your entire organization. Afterward, um, Commissioner Rob Manfred would have been able to adjust the cap up or down for the duration of the CBA, which often stretches over five years. So passing out of the league has requested unilateral control over the cap before. It should be noted that a reduction of 30 minor league jobs per organization would result in the unemployment of 900 players across minor league baseball as a whole. Let me say that again, let it sink in. 30 minor league jobs lost per organization would result in 900 jobs being lost across minor league baseball as a whole. Can't have it. Cannot have it. This would be in addition to the jobs lost when the league slashed more than 40 minor league affiliates two years ago, greatly reducing the size of the farm system apparatus as a whole in general. So even if the union does not agree to the league's proposal, Jeff Passan reported, they're open to reducing the size of the draft on a permanent basis to help keep inventory of minor league players at a more healthy level. The union did offer to move to a 20-round draft heading forward or the same size as the 2021 class. The draft had been 40 rounds prior to 2020. 40 rounds, that's crazy. See, that's why I thought I had a chance to get drafted. You draft for so many rounds, I was wrong. Maybe if they had 41, I would have made it. MLB owners, you know, locked out the players with the expiration of the previous CBA in early December, as we've said over and over again. The owners did not have to do so, as the two sides could have continued to negotiate as part of the last CBA sunset provisions. Um, at the time, Manfred claimed it was a defense mechanism to hasten negotiate negotiations. I liked the proactivity at the time. I was wrong. He was wrong. And that has obviously not been the case, because here we are. Pitchers and catchers should be in camp doing soft toss drills and conditioning, and unfortunately, they are not. So that's the latest news. Not good news, but the league requests the ability to eliminate hundreds of minor league roster spots per a report 
from Jeff Passan. Not cool. Can't thank you enough for being with us today. Our Zips projections will roll on again manana. Also, we'll take a look at some Cubs designated hitter options moving forward now that it's going to be a permanent spot in the National League. Like it or not, here it comes. We thank you for making Locked On Cubs your first listen each and every day. I want to ask you to make your second listen Locked On Bets. It's your daily one-stop shop for all of your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling, just like Locked On Cubs, free and available wherever you download your favorite podcast. Until tomorrow, have a great Wednesday, Locked On fam. We'll see you then.